A very warm welcome to all of you, to all of you who are with me here in the room and to all of those of you who are joining us online to this, what is the opening session of the 22nd European Week of Regions and Cities. My name is Rosie Burchard. I'm a journalist and I'm also your host for today. And we are going to be going from this room on a tour of the European continent, across the European Union and beyond, to hear voices from all sorts of levels of politics. And we are together, all of you are part of this, kicking off a week of discussions under the theme of empowering communities, looking at how regions can be drivers of change and prosperity and innovation, and how to build a stronger and more cohesive European Union. Now, I have some housekeeping announcements for you. First of all, you will see on your desks there should be a headset. That is available for interpretation. And for those of you joining at home, interpretation is also available online. Uh, I also would like to invite you to join the discussion and the debate online. You can do so by using the hashtag EU Regions Week. Now, this opening session is going to run as follows. We're uh, cutting it into three sections. First of all, we're going to look at the current state of regions and cities. Then, in section two, we'll be zooming in on the EU's main investment policy, cohesion policy. And after that, we'll look really at the future of the EU and the future with a particularly regards to EU enlargement. Now, we are going to be, as you can imagine, diving into all of those details. But first of all, uh, the organizers have prepared a video for you, which really sums up the essence of this week, because what it highlights and showcases are voices from local and regional authorities. So please, tune in. Cada año nos enfrentamos a más y más fenómenos meteorológicos extremos. Esta situación me preocupa. En mi ciudad es necesario plantar más árboles, restaurar zonas naturales, desarrollar infraestructuras más ecológicas y medios de transporte más sostenibles. Estamos trabajando por una transición verde que nos beneficie a todos, pero necesitamos tener mayor financiación y poder participar en la toma de decisiones para que la transición sea justa para nuestros ciudadanos. W mojej gminie mieliśmy do czynienia z sytuacjami nadzwyczajnymi obejmującymi uchodźców z Ukrainy. Teraz pomagamy przy odbudowie. Kwestia przyjęcia kolejnych państw do Unii Europejskiej jest bardzo ważna. Państwa kandydujące muszą się dobrze przygotować do przystąpienia do Unii. Ale też europejskie miasta i regiony muszą być na to gotowe. To może być dla nich szansą, ale też pewnym wyzwaniem. Musimy aktywnie uczestniczyć w tych działaniach. Dans ma région, nous soutenons les jeunes entrepreneuses et entrepreneurs. Nous encourageons les nouvelles entreprises. Nous investissons dans le développement des compétences. Nous travaillons chaque jour pour accroître le potentiel de notre territoire. Le soutien de l'Europe est crucial pour nous aider dans nos efforts. I'm a counselor in a rural area where I live people do not always feel listened to. We are working hard to involve them in participative processes at local, regional and European levels. My aim is to make their voices heard. Only like this, we can build a European Union made by everyone for everyone. Yes, quite right. It deserves a round of applause because already in that video we outlined some of these big questions that we're going to be addressing today. I saw one woman talking about something which is both a challenge and an opportunity and that's what we're going to look at in this first section because we're looking at the current state of play, the state of Europe's regions and cities.
The state of play suggests that we're looking at how things stand currently. And of course, we have a room full of experts, people who know all about it because you're involved in the local sphere in one way or another or a regional level. But we're not just hearing from voices. This is also something we have data and insights on. And that is very much through the annual report on the state of regions and cities. And that will be the starting point in many ways for our discussion today. And to talk more about that and give us a broad overview through his annual address on the state of European regions of cities. I would like you now to join me in giving a very warm welcome to Vasco, Vasco Alvaro, Alves Cordero, who is the president of the European Committee of the Regions. President Cordero, please join me on stage. Thank you, President. Over to you. Madam Commissioner, dear Elisa, Mr. Vice President of the European Parliament, dear Yunos, members of the European Committee of the Regions, dear colleagues, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the European Committee of the Regions, on behalf of more than one million local and regional elected officials who across Europe embody this level of government, it is a great honor for me to declare open the 2024 edition of the European Week of Regions and Cities. This year, it comes at a particular time. It comes at a challenging time. After millions of citizens voted in June, we are starting a new political cycle in the European Union, with a renewed European Parliament, a renewed European Commission, and a renewed leadership of the European Council. With this new political cycle, we will be able to count on the many members of the European Parliament who experienced what it means to lead a local or regional community. With this new political cycle, we are proud to count on Antonio Costa, our former colleague, as the next president of the European Council. His career and experience, starting as mayor of Lisbon and then as prime minister of Portugal, will be a great asset for the Union. A few weeks ago, President von der Leyen presented her College of Commissioners including our first Vice President, Apostolos Tsitsikostas, to whom I wish all the best. <clears throat> to all of them today, I would like to extend the readiness and willingness of the European Committee of the Regions, the readiness and willingness of cities and regions across Europe to cooperate to help, to join forces to make the European Union walk along a path that is not one of the vision, resentment and hate. Willingness to join forces to make the European Union walk along a path of unity, diversity and solidarity. If we want to succeed, we must understand that the state of our Union starts with the state of our regional and local communities. The strength of our union starts with the strength of our local and regional communities. And to understand our union, its needs, its challenges, its powers, or its shortcomings, we need to first understand its regions and cities. The path starts with regions and cities. This is why, dear colleagues, it is a step in the right direction. It is a good sign that President von der Leyen, addressing the newly appointed commissioners, asked them to engage more with local and regional representatives. 
But let us be clear. European leaders here in Brussels cannot continuously call for Europe to be closer to its citizens if they keep approaching it from the top. We need to start in our local communities and in our regions in the context of a loyal, frank, and committed partnership. Cork, Novo Mesto, Vasteras, Portimão, Lintrup, Saint Etienne. In these cities, ahead of the European elections, thousands of citizens gathered for local dialogues, exchanging views and ideas with their representatives about this union of ours. We have this sense of dialogue deeply rooted in us. For 30 years now, the European Committee of the Regions has carried that flag high in the European debate. The European Committee of the Regions was the first to launch its network of EU local and regional councillors. Now we welcome the commitment by President von der Leyen in her political guidelines to join forces in the, on this matter. This is the method we call for. This is what we have already started with our new cooperation agreements with the European Parliament and the European Commission. This is how, together, we can strengthen democracy in Europe. Chers collègues, la démocratie et nos valeurs fondamentales nous définissent en tant qu'union. Nous ne sommes pas enfermés sur nous-mêmes. La voie que nous traçons aujourd'hui traverse un monde complexe. Cela fait plus de deux ans que l'Ukraine résiste à l'invasion de grande échelle. Notre soutien est inébranlable, quoi qu'il en coûte et aussi longtemps qu'il le faudra. Les régions et les villes se sont unies à leurs sœurs ukrainiennes pour faire face aux pertes et aux destructions. Nos villes et régions resteront unies pour reconstruire un avenir meilleur. L'objectif de Poutine est clair, priver les Ukrainiennes et les Ukrainiens d'une vie normale, de la possibilité de chauffer leur maison, de cuisiner, de s'éclairer. À l'approche de l'hiver, et comme nous l'avons fait depuis le début de la guerre, les régions et les villes européennes sont prêtes à apporter leur soutien. Pour traverser cette période, j'ai appelé tous nos membres et partenaires à fournir des générateurs d'électricité, des composants de réseaux électriques, des équipements à haute tension, des systèmes de chauffage et des éléments d'infrastructure pour l'approvisionnement en eau. Kiev, Kharkiv, Lviv et tous les villes et régions d'Ukraine, nous sommes avec vous. Tel est le esprit de l'Alliance européenne des régions et des villes pour la reconstruction de l'Ukraine. Slava Ukraini. Chers collègues, <coughs> chers collègues, cela fait un an aujourd'hui que les terribles attaques terroristes menées par le Hamas contre Israël, Hamas contre Israël ont eu lieu. Nous l'avons condamné dès le premier jour et nous le condamnons toujours. Trop d'otages sont encore captifs et ils doivent être libérés. Depuis, la violence s'est emballée dans la région et je n'ai pas des mots assez forts pour décrire la situation humanitaire qui règne. Au-delà des nationalités, des croyances ou des convictions politiques, il y a avant tout des êtres humains. Ce qui s'est passé il y a un an, mais aussi ce qui s'est passé depuis avec des vies innocentes est inhumaine 
diabolique dans sa forme la plus cruelle. Israël doit respecter le droit international et nous avons besoin d'en cesser le feu maintenant. Comme l'a dit, dit Martin Luther King, je le cite, « Ce qui m'effraie, ce n'est pas le bruit des méchants, c'est le, le silence des bons. » Nous ne resterons pas en silence en tant que comité européen des régions, en tant que région et ville d'Europe. Nous appelons à la paix. To the challenges of this time, we must add the growing impact of the climate crisis. Every day, regions and cities are confronted with it. We think of the flooded streets in Trusina, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Vienna, Krnov, and Lukoklasi, the droughts in the Sicilian farmlands or the wildfires surrounding Athens and the northern part of Portugal. It is getting worse and Europeans are losing their lives. Our societies, our economies and industries are also undergoing profound transformations. We do not have time to lose anymore. We do not have the luxury to sit around and wait for institutions to be freed from that lock. We cannot wait either for the rest of the world to solve these problems. We cannot rely on the will of a few hundred voters in Arizona in November. The conclusion is simple. Europe must be stronger. And again, the path starts in its regions and cities. Regions and cities handle almost all, all climate mitigation and adaptation policies. We are paving the way to the future and we are doing it now. Turku will be climate neutral already by 2029. Gabrovo is making schools energy efficient. Budapest develops flood protection systems. Kozice restores land and biodiversity. Occitanie produces hydrogen to propel their trucks and tractors. Bremen protects the groundwater in its harbor. Across Europe, silently, regions and cities are the place where the green transition is happening. For every 10 euros spent on the environment, eight are spent locally. This speaks volume. The green transformation is an ambitious task requiring efforts and investments. We need to invest up to 200 billion euros a year in climate adaptation. Such investment will bring up to 440 billion euros per year in terms of economic benefits. This comes on top of the health of our people and our planet. Our message is clear. Local and regional authorities are key for the success of the European Green Deal based on multi-level governance and targeted financial support. We cannot wait, but we cannot do it alone. Again, here, the path starts with regions and cities. With the green and digital transitions going on full speed, our industries must adapt. Think, think of the coal production sites in Silesia, Silesia, steel plants in Cantabria, or manufacturers in the Ruhr Valley, or here, a few kilometers away in Forêt, Brussels, where a large car plant is closing its doors, leaving thousands of workers without jobs and without hope. Once powerful strongholds, such industries are disappearing, are leaving people behind. We need a comprehensive European industrial strategy with regions and cities at its heart as hubs for innovation, community engagement, and reskilling programs. We need to make the best of cross-border cooperation, engaging local and regional authorities, always bearing in mind the realities on the ground. This is how you create real momentum bringing all actors on board, trade unions, public authorities, and local companies. 
sharing the benefits among all. <clears throat> Dear colleagues, a strong Europe is nothing. A strong Europe is nothing if it forgets its people, if it forgets where they live. We cannot ignore that still last year, 100 million Europeans were at risk of poverty or social exclusion. One in five. We cannot ignore and we cannot accept this. Housing prices are skyrocketing. In Copenhagen, one in five inhabitants spend more than 40% of their income on rent. In Ioannina, one in four. Almost half. Imagine that. Almost half of young Europeans must still live with their parents. We can only welcome that the European Commission will put forward an affordable housing plan. But here too, the path starts with regions and cities. In rural areas, people earn 22% less than the European average. In the Limousin or in Sivir and Centralen, you only have one physician for more than 300 inhabitants. Medical deserts are a dire reality in Europe. More than ever, we need to invest in quality public services, to invest in our people, ensuring decent incomes and good social protection. More than ever, we need cohesion. Not because this is charity, but because for decades, cohesion policy has meant progress for Europe. Lifting regions and cities, and with them, lifting people, families, individuals. We have been sounding the alarm bell while some were, or should I say are, tempted to centralize. We have been fighting, rallying the Cohesion Alliance and hundreds of regions across Europe before the European elections. Cohesion policy is needed, but it also needs reforms. We need to keep what works and improve what does not, so we can help all regions and cities in their path, on their path towards sustainable development. Cohesion policy must keep its golden principles. Shared management, partnership, multi-level governance, place-based approach. Cohesion policy must also become more flexible to address new challenges. And it must be simplified. Yes, it must be simplified to help the managing authorities, to help beneficiaries, to help auditing authorities. When we see what is a growing consensus about the importance, the need for a renewed cohesion policy, the latter report, the European Council's strategic agenda, the political guidelines of the European Commission, even the Draghi report, we cannot forget that the work does not stop here. We need to go, to go beyond words and have concrete results. So let us make it happen. And let us make it happen with a good budget. This is our clear and loud message ahead of the budgetary negotiations to come and the European Committee of the Regions will not tone it down. And today, dear colleagues, it is also our clear and loud message, an unequivocal and unapologetic rejection of a recent idea of having one single program at national level in the new multi-annual financial framework, which, if true, would abolish the participation of regions and cities. We strongly reject this not only because of what it represents to regions and cities across Europe, but also because it contradicts everything we have been told in recent times about cohesion policy. So, dear colleagues, 
So, dear colleagues, from this house of democracy, the European Parliament, I call upon its leadership and its members. I call upon the women and the men that represent the people of Europe to rise and to take a stand, to rise and to defend what this proposal, if true, so bluntly intends to destroy. A Europe built by everyone, a Europe for everyone. Dear colleagues, from this house that is built by the will of the people of Europe, I call upon the President of the European Commission to be faithful and to be true to her own words when she said the new cohesion policy should have regions and cities at, it, at its heart. Dear colleagues, from here today, I call upon the regions and cities of Europe to rise and take a stand against a proposal that, if true, implies that we will be excluded, sidelined, bypassed. And let us not forget that more than about regions and cities, this proposal is about the Europe we want to have or we do not want to have in the future. So we have to act now. Caras e caros colegas, <coughs> ao longo dos últimos cinco anos, pudemos contar com uma excelente parceria com a comissária Elisa Ferreira. O seu trabalho, o seu compromisso, a sua liderança na pasta da coesão e reformas foram essenciais, foram decisivas não só para a construção de uma parceria leal e profícua, mas também para defender e promover a causa da coesão em tempos tão turbulentos e tão desafiantes como aqueles que vivemos no mandato da Comissão Europeia, que agora termina. Em nome do Comitê das Regiões, quero hoje aqui deixar a expressão pública do nosso reconhecimento e do nosso agradecimento. A nova Comissão Europeia A nova Comissão Europeia também em nome do Comitê das Regiões dou as boas-vindas oferecendo a nossa total disponibilidade para o estabelecimento de uma cooperação honesta, franca e leal na realização de um dos principais objetivos da União, a coesão económica, social e territorial. Caras e caros colegas, mas a propósito da coesão temos de ter a consciência que temos um trabalho inacabado. Temos ainda de convencer os que não estão convencidos. Mas, sobretudo, temos de permanecer vigilantes e proativos. A política de coesão é um benefício para todas as regiões e assim deve continuar a ser. E isto é fundamental, isto é vital para o projeto europeu. Dear colleagues, a closer, stronger and more cohesive for Europe is the foundation we need for the future. It is the condition for its path forward we are charting. With everything I have mentioned already at stake, the future of Europe can only be an ambitious one. Enlargement. Enlargement is not only a moral duty that lies upon us. It's a geopolitical necessity that drives us. It's a strategic move, a strategic investment essential for our future. To prepare for enlargement, we need regions and cities, both in member states and candidate countries, to work hand in hand. And we are already doing so. Zadar and Morstar have a joint program on social inclusion. Puglia leads cross-border cooperation on sustainable development with its counterparts across the Adriatic in Albania. 
Valenje and Plevitlia are working on the energy transition together. Jurbarkas and Kriuleni meet regularly to discuss cultural cooperation. We at the European Committee of the Regions are already doing so. We open our program for young elected politicians to candidate countries. They are here with us today. We have opened offices in our headquarters for our Ukrainian friends from Lviv, Vinitsia, and Dnipropetrovsk. We support capacity building to public experts in the administrations of candidate countries via technical assistance and information exchange. Today, I am proud to announce that we will launch a new training and internship program for Ukrainian mayors, their deputies, and local and regional authorities, staff, and specialists on project management in cooperation with you lead. Here, too, the path starts with regions and cities. But we know that enlargement does not only create expectations for candidate countries. We also have a responsibility as a union to ensure that it delivers for all. It will require time, dialogue, effort. We need to go beyond short-termism and accept what is clear. We must reform the way we work in the European Union. But first things first, the next multiannual financial framework of the European Union is key and must concentrate our attentions. This is why we call for a stronger and renewed cohesion policy. This is why we need to reform the common agriculture policy. This is why we will need new own resources. This is our path forward. This is how we make Europe more ambitious. Dear colleagues, by talking to the people where they live, by taking the time to understand our communities, we can picture the state of regions and cities. It is diverse as much as it is united, like Europe, united in diversity. To all the new leaders in the European institutions, this state of regions and cities must act as a reminder. Good policies are done with your feet on the ground. Fair policies are done by taking the pulse of the people wherever they live. Strong policies are ones that are made with territorial realities in mind. For 30 years, this assembly of local and regional representatives, the European Committee of the Regions has acted as a loyal and constructive partner for the European project, and we will continue to do so. With the European Parliament, with the European Commission, with the European Council, because, dear friends, because the path to a stronger, fairer, and more cohesive Europe for all starts with regions and cities. Thank you. President Cordero, thank you so much. That was Vasco Alves Cordero, President of the European Committee of the Regions. Thank you so much, President Cordero. President, I can invite you to stay on stage with us because we're going to continue the debate. You covered a lot of ground in that speech, and now we are going to also go to the ground uh, by inviting to join us on stage and continue the debate several members of the European Committee of the Regions. So in addition to President Cordero, could I please ask you to warm, warmly welcome Sari Rautio, who is a member of Hamidlina City Council. Sari Rautio, please join us on stage. I'd also like to call on stage Carolina Darias San Sebastian, who is mayor of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria City. Mayor Darias, please join us. Thank you, Ms. Rauto, you can take a seat here. And lastly, please also give a warm welcome to Urmas Klas, who is the mayor of Tartu. Please take a seat here. And Mayor Klas, just over here, thank you so much. So, 
This part of our discussion is all about getting views from the ground. You heard there, uh, as I said, we covered a, a whole range of topics by uh, President Cordero. And I'd like to start with you, Ms. Rautio, Sari Rautio, member of Hamadlida City Council. Can you give us what's your reaction to what you've heard so far and tell us what is the state of play where you are? Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, hello everyone, it's so great to be here. Uh, and uh, you know, last year I told you about the birth of my grandson, and now a year has gone, and a lot of has happened, and still we still have a lot to do. But we've taken baby steps also back home, but also we've taken baby steps in, in, uh, towards democracy. And I want to thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, for your uh, great contribution in the beginning. And I want to give you three examples of what's been happening in my home city, in the city of Hamelin in Finland. And they all uh, look after the democracy. For the first, uh, Hamelina is the first child-friendly city in Finland, and we definitely want all our kids to learn from democracy, learn about participation, and we do have a path of participation, and we, in, in that path, all the children, every boy, every girl, no one is left behind, is learning how to uh, work sustainably, how to participate, how to act democratically. And we think this is really crucial in these times what we are living at the moment. Also, we have a project that goes on with the adults, all citizens in Hamelina. We learn to discuss with each other. We have a, a way to debate uh, sustainably. It's called the timeout, and I'm very happy to tell more about that later on. Uh, the second thing I want to share you is the importance, also looking at the democracy, of the, that we have to communicate on the EU-funded investments and to show how all these different investments we are doing with the EU, uh, we EU money can, co can cum accumulate more thing, good things in the future. The thing we all have to do is to communicate and tell about these things. Twenty years ago, we built again, the first uh, uh, urban national park in the city center, and that has accumulated a lot of new investments, nature uh, uh, reservation, and all these good things. And we have to tell about it all the time. Last thing, what I'm really proud of, what I want to tell you, is about our new twin city in Ukraine. We have a twin city in Sumy, Ukraine, and that is the most, the biggest thing I'm so proud of. We all can do something. None of us can do everything. So, but these three small examples from Finland. Thank, Thank you. you very much, and congratulations on your grandchild. That's what you alluded to as well there. Um, Mir Darius, can I uh, t turn over to you? So tell us what's been going on where you are. Muy buenas tardes, saludos cordiales. Como hemos visto en el informe que acaba de realizar el presidente del Comité de las Regiones, las ciudades y las regiones tenemos muchos retos. Uno de ellos es el acceso a la vivienda. De ahí la importancia de llevar a cabo una política de vivienda que impulse, que facilite, que rehabilite y que permita el acceso a una vivienda digna. Como está haciendo el gobierno de España, presidido por Pedro Sánchez, haciendo de la vivienda un objetivo prioritario y además instalando en el quinto pilar del Estado del Bienestar e invirtiendo 9.000 millones de euros con fondos Next Generation. Eso ha permitido que en mi ciudad, junto con otras administraciones, estemos construyendo en este mandato mil viviendas públicas en régimen de alquiler, con una inversión ya de 35 millones que nos está permitiendo construir ya 268 viviendas. Y además estamos hablando de viviendas públicas ligadas a la excelencia, a la excelencia constructiva y también a la excelencia energética, con sellos de calidad, como es el sello británico Brian y también el estadounidense LEED. Y también algo muy importante que tiene que ver con lo público, la excelencia y la innovación, creando en estas viviendas espacios nuevos como el coworking o el coliving. En definitiva, a través de la acción pública municipal estamos construyendo viviendas que mejoran la vida de la gente, que crean entornos más seguros, más saludables, que permiten e impulsan la buena vecindad y que mejoramos la vida de la gente como garantía del progreso social. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Mayor Klaas, can I ask you please to take us to Tartu? Yes. Uh, Mr. President, Madam Commissioner, uh, the city of Tartu is um, holding the title of European Capital of Culture 2024 this year. I am also very happy to say that Hamelina is uh, our uh, sister city. 
but um, yes, important is the city of Tartu is European capital of culture, and this is the biggest culture, cultural project of European Union, European capital of culture. But Ischl in Austria and uh, Buda in Norway, they are also uh, European capitals of culture this year. And uh, what is important, talking about Europe and um, about regions and cities in Europe, that Tartu is not alone uh, European capital of culture, together with 20 municipalities from southern Estonia. And this is important, that this project uh, brings together not only cities, but also regions and uh, uh, cities from whole Europe. Our artistic concept is arts of survival. How to survive during those difficult times, uh, facing so many challenges like climate crisis, uh, war in the Europe, of course, first of all, and, and, and other things. And believe me, uh, as uh, Estonian President Lennart Meri says once, Europe is not a peer festival. Europe is, first of all, Athens, Rome and Jerusalem. It means Europe means values, European values, and we should protect them. And dear friends from Ukraine, two weeks ago, the city council of Tartu decided to sign a twin city agreement with the city of Lviv. Thank you very much, Mayor Klaas. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to you now, some of our audience members, and I'd like to first call on Yaroslav Stavyarsky. I believe you are in seat number 190. Could I ask you please to stand up and introduce yourself, and we will pass the microphone over to you. So if you stand up, and once your microphone is read, if you are, I invite you to. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Mama, it's okay. So you państwo. Sądzę, że kluczowe jest, abyśmy pamiętali, że dobrobyt naszych regionów wynika wprost z siły naszych lokalnych gospodarek. Tylko poprzez dynamiczny rozwój gospodarczy i biznesowy możemy zapewnić trwałe funkcjonowanie szkół, szpitali, infrastruktury oraz innych usług publicznych. Należy również podkreślić, że problem wyludniania, który został dokładnie opisany w rocznym raporcie, dotyczy przede wszystkim regionów, które nie oferują mieszkańcom wystarczających możliwości zatrudnienia niezbędnych do budowania stabilnego życia. Dla to tak ważne jest, abyśmy skupili się na odbudowie naszych fundamentów gospodarczych i przemysłowych. Poza tym powinniśmy jeszcze raz przyjrzeć się tym regulacjom Zielonego Ładu, które najbardziej szkodzą przemysłowi w naszych regionach, prowadząc do zwijania się produkcji. Musimy w ten sposób konstruować przyszłe wieloletnie ramy finansowe oraz nowe regulacje, aby wzmacniały konkurencyjność naszych regionów i wspierały produktywność. Dziękuję. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would like to also hand over to Luis Antunes. I believe you are in seat number 403. Could I ask you to stand up? and introduce yourself, and your mic should be open. Over to you. I think, yes, thank you. I talk no. in Portuguese. Uma primeira saudação, é uma honra poder intervir hoje, uma primeira saudação ao nosso Presidente do Comitê das Regiões e à nossa Comissária Elisa Ferreira. Procuramos no, nosso, no meu território, um território de baixa densidade em Portugal, ter o desenvolvimento sustentável como um objetivo nuclear da nossa atuação. Queremos fixar pessoas, atrair pessoas no sentido de ter o território povoado. Nesse sentido, e para que consigamos esse objetivo de desenvolvimento sustentável, temos procurado, ao nível da gestão florestal, implementar políticas públicas, ações que tenham em vista a valorização da fileira florestal, nomeadamente através da área de paisagem protegida e da área integrada de gestão da paisagem, bem como a regeneração de várias áreas da nossa Serra da Lousã. Ao mesmo tempo, olhamos para os recursos endógenos como oportunidades e como formas de geração de riqueza. E, nesse sentido, temos tido políticas de apoio ao empreendedorismo e, que, e incentivo ao investimento privado. 
exemplo de desenvolvimento sustentável é a rede, a estratégia de eficiência coletiva, as aldeias do Xisto, combinando investimento público e privado, bem como as diferentes usos do espaço florestal que pretendemos sempre incentivar. Criámos recentemente, no sentido de capacitar as pessoas para o empreendedorismo e também para a área do desenvolvimento sustentável de negócios, a Lausanne Green School, com o objetivo de reforçar esta nossa aposta no desenvolvimento sustentável e num território vivo, atrativo, e económica e socialmente sustentável. Obrigado. Thank you very much. And I, I'm going to hand over back now to our... Yeah, please, give, give our speakers a round of applause. Thank you. To our panellists. So, you call yourselves politicians. I'm going to check your political communication skills because I would like to ask you to react to what you've heard so far. So, tell us what we heard about demographic challenges, we heard about the green transition, many other things. Are there, are there lessons you perhaps could learn from that or share? Sari Rautio, I hand over to you first. You have, uh, I think we're going to give each of you about 30 seconds. So, the test starts yes. now. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, and I, I totally agree the importance of reaching out to people. Uh, if we don't have democracy, if we don't have participation, then we lack everything. So I think this is uh, the main thing we ought to do now uh, during the next period, uh, to look after so that all people who are in Europe, all European, no, every, every boy, every girl, has the feeling that he or she belongs to this uh, Europe, our common Europe. So I think this is very wise, that you, what you said. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mayor Darius? Solo tenemos un planeta A, no tenemos un planeta B, ni ciudades B, ni, ni regiones B. Solo es ahora cuando todos y cada uno de quienes tenemos responsabilidades públicas debemos asumir el, el reto de enfrentar las transiciones, la transición verde, la transición digital y la Unión Europea. La Comisión tiene que darse cuenta que solo a través de las regiones y las ciudades será posible hacerlo, con una ciudadanía mucho más comprometida con la Unión Europea, pero una Unión Europea que sienta cercana a quienes vivimos en los territorios, especialmente los que estamos más alejados, para dar oportunidades a todas las personas vivan donde vivan en el territorio de la Unión Europea. Thank you very much. Mayor Klaas, I hand over to you. Yes, thank you. I would stay um, by uh, the culture. Uh, because, um, first of all, uh, we should talk about European values. Mm -hmm. And democracy, participation is a very important European uh, value. And um, uh, in that context, um, really, the culture will give for everyone very good an opportunity to be participated, to be involved into, into our societies, because every person... Uh, has uh, knowledge, has uh, skills, values, and we should really recognize all those. Thank you. Thank you very much. And President Cordero, don't think I've forgotten about you. You've been listening, and of course, that's what you're here to do as well, to listen to the views from the ground. But please uh, give us your thoughts on what you've heard so far, and we're leading toward the end of this segment now. Uh, I've already said what I think I wanted to say in advance. I won't take more time. Thank okay, you. very well. Thank you so much, President. Well, uh, with that, I would like now to give the floor virtually uh, to our host. So let's hear now th through a video message from Roberto Metzola, who is the President of the European Parliament. Dear friends, welcome to the European Parliament. It is truly a pleasure for us to host the opening ceremony of the European Week of Regions and Cities. Europe's regions, cities and villages are hubs of economic activity, education, culture and democracy. It is where communities, the bedrock of European society, coalesce and thrive. They are where Europe starts and where our policies impact. Many of you are on the front lines of so many pressing issues that matter to our citizens. Just like members of the European Parliament, you listen to and respond to them daily. By bringing together elected representatives from across the continent, we can develop more effective common solutions to shared challenges. And there's no better place to start than here, in the heart of the European Parliament. That is why this annual event is a fixture in our calendars. The European elections took place just a few months ago, 
and men members in this House are gearing up for the new mandate. I want to thank each and every one of you for your commitment and support in helping to get out the vote. We joined forces in order to emphasize the importance of taking part in the largest multinational democratic exercise in the world. And it worked. Our memorandum of understanding outlining how our two institutions could work together to engage with voters was essential. It helped to ensure that our message extended beyond capitals into every region, town and village of our union. Looking ahead, there are multi-tiered challenges for both MEPs and local authorities to tackle. And with so much at stake and citizens looking to us for answers, I hope that we can continue to nurture and grow our relationship further into our domains, other domains as well. Cohesion is one such area. The European Parliament has always been a vocal supporter of a strong European cohesion policy, not just out of solidarity, but also in the pursuit of mutual progress. In 2025, the European Commission will present its proposal for the next EU multi-annual budget, followed by a plan to reform our cohesion policy. With regions and cities driving 50% of public investment and responsible for 30% of public expenditure, reinforcing economic, social and territorial cohesion in the new EU budget is crucial. This ties directly into Ukraine's recovery, reconstruction and EU accession. The European Union's unity on this matter is something that I'm especially proud of. Now is not the time to let up. We must remain firm in our support, including through the European Alliance of Cities and Regions for the Reconstruction of Ukraine. Regions and cities must be central to this process. Today, the Committee of Regions will present its annual report on the state of regions and cities. I'm optimistic that it too will be an engine for further cooperation over the course of this legislative term. I wish you all a productive week and hope your discussions lead to concrete solutions that deliver for our citizens. Thank you. That was Roberta Metzola, and I ask you to continue your round of applause for all our speakers, and I'll invite you now to take your seats back in the audience. Thank you so much. That wraps up our first part of this opening session. Now, I promised you that this would be in three different sections, so we are now moving on to our second segment, which is all about that key pillar of the European Union, the bloc's main investment policy, cohesion policy, and looking and working toward a cohesion policy that leaves no one behind. We are going to be looking at working out, discussing how to ensure that all regions, whether they are urban or rural, whether they are wealthy or struggling financially, how they can all contribute and thrive in building a collective future for the European Union. And of course, there are few people better qualified to discuss that than Elisa Ferreira, who is the Commissioner, the European Commissioner for Co uh, Cohesion and Reforms. Please welcome her to the stage. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, good afternoon to all of you. And it is, in fact, a very emotional and a very important moment for me to be here today. I would like to start by um, saying a very special word to the President of the Committee of the Regions, Vasco Cordeiro, and thank him by his kind, for his kind words. I would also like to have a special reference to Vice President of the European Parliament, Yunus Amarji, uh, and, uh, and to thank in his personality also all the work that we have done in, during these five years uh, with you, with the members of the European Parliament. But I want to express my gratitude, in fact, to all of you, to representatives of regions, of municipalities, and in particular to the members of the Committee of the Regions that were partners in permanence in these five very exciting years that we are closing now. And in fact, it was hard, it was difficult, but it worked. 
And uh, I think having the opportunity to address you in this uh, last, for me, meeting of uh, the European Week of Regions and Cities, I think uh, we are, we couldn't have a better way to celebrate the work and the impact, the positive impact of European cohesion policy. In fact, this week brings together the real stakeholders, the practitioners, those that make the economic, the social, the territorial cohesion across Europe a true reality for our citizens. And being this last event, I think I should take stock of some general uh, reminders of uh, what we have been facing together during these five years. First of all, the evidence on cohesion policy, then uh, to pinpoint some emblematic initiatives, and then uh, to take some takeaways, some lessons learned. And in fact, uh, we produced uh, two cohesion reports, you know them, one in 2022, another in 2024. And uh, these reports, these cohesion reports, they confirm that in fact cohesion works and that it is right when the World Bank calls European cohesion policy a convergence machine. Just a couple of examples. Cohesion, uh, cohesion support has helped the number of European citizens living in less developed countries inside Europe uh, this number, the amount, the percentage of people that were living in those countries was one-fourth of the European population in the year 2000. Now, in 2023, it was reduced from one-fourth of the population to just 5%. This is something. But I give you another example. In our last enlargement, the most recent one that went into three phases, as you know, but in 2004, and I have shared this with some of you, the average income per capita for those countries that joined was about half of the European average. Today, it is on average, again, 80%. So there is no wonder why so many other countries want to join, because they have to offer also themselves a prospect of good and decent life. It comes with democracy through enlargement, through joining this incredible project. And in fact, people on the ground feel it. The well-being has improved, and it's not only reflected in this income increase. It is reflected in very practical things. We have just, again, a couple of examples. Almost very close to 8 million households benefited through cohesion from improved broadband connection. 63 million people have access to better health care. 6,000 megawatts of renewable energy capacity were created with the support of the cohesion funding. And this also helps energy sovereignty, which is an objective for Europe. 550,000 households have benefited from increased energy performance. And I could mention investment in railways, in roads, in sewage, in water supply, in training, in education, I mean, you name it. So in fact, I think cohesion policy has a lot to show, a lot to demonstrate. But my second point in this kind of summary, I, in this second point, I would like to stress some emblematic initiatives we took during this mandate. One of them is the Europe's recognition that carbon-dependent re regions 
such as coal mining regions, very heavy industrialized regions, were faced with extreme difficulties in adapting to a changing, very fast changing world. And so I think the fact of having creating a, created a just transition fund is in itself a sign of how we can dedicate special attention and special funds when the problems are more difficult to be solved just on the basis of the local and regional energies. So we are working with the 100 different territories and I'm delighted to note that it was difficult, but now the Just Transition Fund is being implemented with hundreds of projects and 70 out of these projects, at least 70, are just initiative by very young people that in those territories they want to be actors of change. A second example of these emblematic initiatives is in fact the need that we were faced with to organize ourselves in order to have an immediate crisis response. And here I want to thank all of you. I came several times to the European Parliament and I want to thank also the staff, the public administration, both from the European Commission and from the member states. They were incredible, but in fact it worked because immediately for COVID we have reprogrammed 23 billion euros. Then we had Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine and we had to accommodate a lot, a lot of citizens from Ukraine that were trying to save their lives. And for that we have reallocated uh, very close to 14 billion euros. Then we had, uh, and with this, we helped uh, housing, healthcare, schooling, training, and in fact, the integration of those uh, fellow citizens from Ukraine was very successful. Uh, likewise, for energy crisis, we had to reprogram uh, more than 4 billion euros exactly to help the small companies and the, uh, and the, the less uh, affordable households to face the reality of a sudden increase of energy, that uh, the price of energy that was not just a market-driven um, event. So this emergency support. And third, I would like to mention the need and our attention to very specific problems of specific regions or specific challenges. One of them is the need that we have put in the front line to address with special care what we usually call brain drain. And we took an initiative, we called it harnessing talent in the regions that are losing their best. And 82 regions were identified as risky regions in the sense that they require some specific action both by the national, regional and local actors, but also from us here at the European level. And we created what we call a booster mechanism. But also, we reinforced our, our support and renewed our partnership with our outermost regions. And we created specific lines of support of the order of about uh, 16 billion euros in order to lift those regions out of uh, 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 kind of blocking uh, constraints uh, that are affecting a lot of them. But also we addressed quality in the use of cohesion funding and the new European Bauhaus that a lot of you have engaged into and a lot of young people have been engaging very, very, very strongly is another success story. We launched because competitiveness cannot be just the stronghold of a couple of countries or a couple of cities. We started Regional Innovation Valleys Initiative, trying exactly to foster innovation all across Europe. And we have amazing examples in the most unexpected regions from the traditional perspective that only the strong ones can innovate. It's not true. And we completed this analysis with the initiative 
to change what since 2004 at least was the rule by offering cohesion policy support to, so that weaker regions and weaker countries could also attract and accommodate clean, green tech, deep tech, biotech, even when these strategic sectors were done and the attraction was of big companies and not only small and medium companies. So this step that stands for strategic technologies for Europe platform is already mobilizing a lot of interest. We already have proposals from six member states. Fifteen of their regions are uh, using uh, more than six billion euros exactly to attract to not so obvious regions, not so deep pocket countries, the capacity to also engage in the future-oriented kind of, um, of investments and industries. And the work continues because now we are reflecting and trying to accommodate some extra example of this flexibility in order to address natural disasters that were already mentioned here today, reinforcing the build back better approach uh, in a line that the European Parliament asked uh, very clearly for and preparing a future support from cohesion policy exactly to respond to the adaptation of uh, the regions, cities and countries to uh, climate and to unexpected events that are becoming more and more frequent, unfortunately. But now, now it's time to think about the future, to prepare the future. And uh, in fact, uh, I created and I had the, the great pleasure to listen today to one of the members of this high-level group, um, Sari Rauti, that was a very active member, but uh, among the, the uh, old participants there must be more that I have not met yet. But in fact, we created a high-level group uh, with the local authority, people coming from local authorities, civil society, academia, and this triggered a very, very important and strong debate on how we could improve cohesion policy. Uh, together with the eighth and ninth cohesion reports, I think we have all engaged into this, and I was very glad to note that in a lot of member states there was a very strong and a very fruitful and a very engaged discussion exactly on this topic, looking forward. And in that sense, I would like also to underline a couple of takeaways, so to speak, from this reflection. And in fact, one of the lessons is in fact that cohesion policy mission is needed more than ever. When we are talking about future, we are talking about greening, digital revolution, demographic changes, the impact of globalization. This doesn't have a balanced impact across regions. If regions want to reap the benefits of the new jobs, of the new investments, they have got to prepare themselves for that. And in order to be able to prepare themselves, they have got to be able to exceed funds and also not only funds, but some other elements that I will refer to later on. The other issue is that the challenges have become more sophisticated, not only because these external forces are very often difficult to control or impossible to control, but because we are understanding that in a lot of regions, not only the most difficult ones, but also some of the most developed ones, there is a new problem, the problem of traps, of development traps, is stagnation, is incapacity to adapt quick enough. And these traps, this stagnation, is associated with the disenchantment of citizens in relation to democracy, in relation to the complexity of the new world. So how to address this? How to uh, access the recipe that brings these regions out of this stagnation or this loss of power. In fact, it is usually associated, this phenomenon, with uh, lack of innovation capacity, weak public services, uh, lack of uh, adequate reforms, lack of skills. 
we have got to address this. Second lesson related to this one is that uh, investment alone is not enough. In fact, uh, investment and funding is an absolutely essential condition. But we need to be able to define the adequate strategies. We have to give to the regions the right administrative capacity to help them to set the right competencies in the principle of subsidiarity, what can be done better at which level. Uh, we have to give them the capacity to understand and to react on time, so they need also budgetary means. They need institutions, qualified institutions. They need skilled workforce. They need a modernized public administration. And we did a lot of work with a lot of you through DG reform. And they helped, in fact, to improve these elements that are more of a qualitative rather than a quantitative na nature. So we, when we talk about growth enhancing reforms, they have got, they have a sense, of course they do, but they have got to be adapted to helping cohesion to deliver. Competitiveness, transition, solidarity, crisis response, all the needs, needs cohesion policy. So cohesion policy must evolve, must progress, because times are changing. So I think it's of a nice word to put it, renewed cohesion policy. Renewed cohesion policy in terms of our commitment to every region in Europe. We have to address all these new issues. Cohesion policy must be renewed also in delivery system, in being faster, being more flexible, being capable to respond to crises that will go on happening. And then renewed also in terms of renewed in the terms of the agreement and recognition of the local and regional partnership. Because it is this partnership that in fact allows us to make the changes occur in the ground, in reality. So yes, renewal, yes, adaptation. However, it is very important that in this renewal, we don't lose the DNA, DNA that has made the policy of su a success. In fact, the DNA that can't be lost is the link to regions, the link to local partners. Moreover, it is important that cohesion is not something that is allocated solely to cohesion policy. Cohesion policy alone cannot do everything. On the contrary, member states and the European Commission have got to give the priority of cohesion when defining their development strategies. All decision makers must ensure that their policy decision takes into account what is the asymmetric impact across countries and across regions, and that this general principle of do no harm to cohesion is somehow taken on board. Our third our third message that is already reflected in what I've said before is this recognition of the power of the energy that we have at the local and regional level. Local knowledge, local experience uh, is absolutely essential for the future. So yes, simplification, but this cannot be done at the expense of the regional and local level because regions, cities, Local areas are core and they are the center of our policy. So everything that has happened until now has in fact confirmed that European policy, European Union needs cohesion policy to tackle long-term development traps, brain drain, emerging demographic divides, to ensure that we'll be able, all the regions, as we did this time, to recover from crisis as soon as possible, and they can go back to the track of long-term development. And helping regions to compete and to thrive uh, with the, the green, the digital, the innovative framework in our minds, that's our destiny, that's what we have to do. And I am very confident because now of course, I'm going to say goodbye to you, but you are the ones that the ball now is in your field. 
I'm very confident when I heard uh, the President of the Commission that has been reinstalled and has been reaffirmed as the future President, so now the future President of the European Commission, when she said in front of the European Parliament last July, and I'm quoting, I am committed to a strong cohesion policy designed together with regions and local authorities. I think this is a commitment at the highest possible level in front of the European Parliament as a kind of guiding principle for the future. So whatever will happen, it's in your hands. But I think we have a good confidence, a good trust that, in fact, our mission, which is the glue that keeps Europe together, will be protected and will be even improved. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Elisa Ferreira there, European Commissioner for Cohesion and Reforms. Commissioner, could I invite you to stay on stage with us? <laughs> Commissioner, could I invite you to stay on stage with us? <laughs> Commissioner Elisa Ferreira there, you can take a seat here. Yeah, Commissioner, I know you said it's time to say goodbye, but not yet. We want to keep you for some more of your insights now as we move on to the next part of our debate. And for that, I would like for you to join me in welcoming back on stage Vasco Elvis Cordero, who is president of the European Committee of the Regions. President, you're welcome to join us on stage. And I would also like to invite on stage Emil Bock, who is the mayor of cluj Nakopa and the former prime minister of Romania. Could I invite you both to join us here and we'll continue this discussion. Thank you very much. Both very polite. President, you can sit here, and Mayor Bok, you can sit right there. Thank you. Emil Bok, I want to come to you first, because we've heard there at length from um, Commissioner Ferreira talking about ways to build a cohesion policy for the future towards a more resilient policy. But I wonder if you could give us your insights from the ground and from, of course, your, your career so far on how to make sure that a renewed cohesion policy gives regions and cities the right tools to address the challenges they're facing currently. Mayor. Thank you so much, dear Commissioner, dear President, dear colleagues, dear President Omarji. Of course, for me, it's uh, an honor, both and a privilege, to address you and to speak about the challenges of the future of cohesion policy. And uh, this policy is the embodiment of what it means to be European. It's the promise that no one will be left behind. It is the spirit that binds us, and it's our pathway to a more inclusive, prosperous, and united future. We heard from the Commissioner Ferreira about the statement of President Ursula von der Leyen that she's asking for a reinforced cohesion policy with a strong role for local and regional authorities. This is just the beginning. It's marked, but now we must put these words in practice. And what we have heard about that from the President of the European Committee of the Regions about one plan for each nation, I don't, so, I don't think so it's fitting with a strong role of cities and regions in the future of cohesion policy. So, there is a rising concern about the centralization of the cohesion policy. And my message today, it's a manifesto against the centralization of the cohesion policy. If we allow the cohesion policy to be centralized, to be driven only from top down like a one size fits all instrument, we risk eroding the very fabric that has made it a success. Centralization may seem like a more efficient way to manage resources, but it would deprive local and regional authorities of their voice, undermine the principle of partnership, and ultimately weaken our union. Let me be very clear. A centralized cohesion policy would be a betrayal of Europe's diversity, of the unique strengths and identities of its regions and cities. It, it would be a departure, that's, I think so, it's pretty much agree. 
it would allow to be a departure from the multi-level governments that has allowed for a sustainable development tailored to the needs for local communities. The greatness of our union lies not in uniformity, but in the harmony of its many voices. A reinforced cohesion policy with strong local and regional involvement is not only a more democratic policy, it is a more effective policy. Local authorities know their communities, their strengths, their needs, and their potential. By giving them a seat at the table of cohesion policy, we are creating a policy that is not just made for the people, but made by the people. Yes, yes, you don't, don't be afraid to applause if you are agree. Take the courage to do that if you are agree. The future of cohesion policy must prioritize, prioritize partnership over centralization, subsidiarity over uniformity, and local action over distant mandates. It must recognize that while our union is one, our regions are many, and it is in this diversity that our strength lies. To safeguard the future of cohesion policy, we need to be vigilant. We need to protect its core values, multi-level governance, partnership principle, share management, the place-based approach, and a cohesion policy for all regions of the European Union. My dream is of a Europe that thrives because it is cohesive. A Europe where every citizen has the freedom to move, but also freedom to stay and prosper in their home region. A Europe that is strong because it values every voice, every region, and every community. Together, we must rise to the challenge. We must advocate for a cohesion policy that is reinforced, not centralized, mm -hmm. that is inclusive, and that puts people at the heart of the mission. By doing so, mm. we'll not only safeguard the future of this policy, but also the future of our European Union itself. We must be bold in our vision, clear in our purpose, and united in our action. So, dear colleagues, please do not bring the centralized spirit of communists back in the very heart of Europe. I'm coming for a country for 50 years or part of the communist regimes, and you can see the difference between East and West. The centralized was the key component of the communist regimes. Do we, we want to bring the spirit of communists inside of our Europe? I hope we, keep, we should keep them as far as we, it possible. One experiment was enough. What is enough, it's enough. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emil Bock. So, Mayor Bock, we heard about your dream, and now I would like to ask for our audience's dreams, because this is the moment where I ask you to take your mobile phones out, because we are going to use Slido to uh, get some of your insights. What do you want the future of European cohesion policy to look like? We have a vote. I think it should be open now. Can we see the votes on the screen, please? Great. So, as you can see, we are asking you if you, the future of cohesion policy should be based on a genuine partnership with regional and local authorities, be further centralised at national level, whether it should focus only on power regions. As you can see, it's, the results are coming in. Now, President Cordero, I might come to you first. How would you vote in this kind of a poll? What's most important for you? Well... Uh, I ask you to take a microphone. There are a lot of... There are a lot of, uh, of statements there that, uh, that are true, but I think exactly the first one, a genuine partnership with regional and local authorities should be the pillar where everything else relies upon. So the partnership uh, is essential, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it, that, that, that statement also implies what we think should be kept in the, new, uh, in the renewed cohesion policy. The multi-level governance, mm -hmm. uh, the local base approach. Uh, so I would vote like that. Commissioner, any reaction from you? Yes. Give it a try. We'll take uh, it I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. try, okay. We okay, hear good. you. <laughs> um, I think, I think, um, I think this answer this answer, uh, the last one, the fourth answer, is uh, the only one that uh, is not compatible with all the rest. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I also agree, and this is a minority, that uh, 
uh, if a policy just concentrates on poor regions, uh, it will tend to disappear because mm. it, is, uh, it is not something on which the whole Europe is engaged. Uh, and uh, if it is just uh, for technical reasons, this is one argument. Yeah. But uh, without being just for technical reasons, I think all regions need support, but adequate to in, in amounts and in uh, the, the type of support to the problems they face. Mayor Balk, uh, a quick word from you. I strongly, I strongly agree what Commissioner Ferreira said. Yes, we need a cohesion policy for all regions of the European Union. This is the very DNA of the cohesion policy. And last but not least, we have a future. As long as 80% are saying that our Europe is stronger just with local and regional with local and regional authorities at the center, that we have a future in the European Union and we have a cohesion policy for whole Europe. Thank you very much for your insights and all from, for all of yours as well. Thank you for filling us in on what you think. Now, we're going to move on from here. I told you you would be going on a tour of this European continent. We're also going to be going on now on a tour of the political spectrum of the Committee of the Regions by hearing from the political leaders, the presidents and political representatives of each political group who will come up onto the stage one by one. So I would like to call first on Olhierd Gablevich, who is president of the EPP group in the European Committee of the Regions. Please, President, the floor is yours. And I ask you all to be brief here so we can move forward with our discussion. Thank you very much. Over to you. Madam Commissioner, uh, dear President, all distinguished guests, it is a great honour to uh, address you and share uh, some, uh, some views of the EPP group in a, such a uh, in a such an outstanding moment during our opening session. Uh, our gathering takes place uh, in a special moment of European policy in a time of shaping of the European Commission, uh, just at the very beginning of the mandate of European Parliament and ahead of our new COR mandate. So, and uh, moreover, in the times of turbulence as we've been living for uh, last year's pandemic, war in Ukraine, then in the Middle East, uh, migration crisis, wildfires, floodings. And so I think that in such a special uh, time, our, our citizens expecting one thing more than ever, being provided with a sense of stability and security and provided with prosperity and with rights to the equal development, regardless of where they live, in the rural or urban areas, on the north, on the east, on the south, on the west. That's why in a, such a special moment of Europe, we need to be vocal and firm in the ensuring that cohesion policy remain to be strong, that it cannot be the victim of any crises. And on the other hand, that we need to clearly and strongly oppose any attempt to nationalize EU funding programs. So it will be the main task for a whole committee of regions in an upcoming mandate. Only when we are successful, we will ensure that all of our regions become competitiveness, uh, competitive and prosperous as Letta and Drug reports calls on and all our citizens will have an equal right to grow and to develop in every village, in every city, in every region across Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now please welcome to the stage Christophe Fouillon, who is the Mayor of Poulain and also the President of the Party of European Socialist Group in the Committee of the Regions. Over to you. Chers collègues, uh, chers amis de la cohésion, de la continuité uh, du uh, président Vasco Cordero, permettez-moi de rendre uh, hommage à Elisa Ferrara, énergique et affûtée commissaire uh, en charge de la politique de cohésion. Vous avez, contre vents et marées, défendu les aides européennes pour le développement de nos territoires uh, ruraux et urbains. Votre bilan est remarquable, chère Elisa. Un grand merci et bravo. J'espère que le pressenti, 
J'espère que le pressenti commissaire à la cohésion, ancien président de la région des Pouilles et ancien membre du Comité européen des régions, président de la Cotère, restera fidèle à la maison et fera respecter le rôle essentiel des régions européennes dans l'élaboration et la mise en œuvre de la politique de cohésion territoriale. La politique de cohésion est notre héritage, un trésor à faire fructifier. Le pré notre ancien euh, président du comité des régions, Karl-Heinz Lambert, disait qu'elle constituait la raison d'être de l'Union européenne, une maison commune où l'on ne laisse personne à l'écart, un espace de vie où la concurrence est régulée par la solidarité, une communauté de destin où l'on aide chacun à saisir sa chance. Nous devons préserver l'essence, la méthode et la, et la de la politique de cohésion, une gestion décentralisée et partagée, une approche territorialisée qui part des territoires et une gouvernance à multiniveau qui permet aux priorités européennes d'être mises en œuvre dans les territoires en s'adaptant à leur réalité. Les défis sont nombreux. Nous ne les ignorons pas. Nous portons des pistes d'amélioration. Par exemple, nous voulons plus de simplicité, de flexibilité permettant aux autorités de gestion de s'adapter aux soubresauts des crises. Nous voulons mieux financer les services publics, notamment pour lutter contre le dépeuplement des campagnes. En écho à la déclaration de Portimao, adoptée en avril dernier par notre groupe politique, la nomination d'un commissaire au logement est une excellente nouvelle. Agissons pour qu'un plan de relance, de construction et de rénovation soit une des priorités du nouveau mandat de la Commission. Notre Assemblée politique doit devenir le moteur d'une Union européenne plus proche des citoyens, plus utile, plus visible, mieux aimée. En cela, l'engagement des régions, des villages et des villes dans la politique de cohésion est un atout que l'Europe doit utiliser. La recentralisation, cher Émile, est une impasse. Ursula von der Leyen a promis que la politique de cohésion serait sanctuarisée et que les régions continueront à jouer un rôle central dans l'élaboration et la mise en œuvre de la politique de cohésion territoriale. Cet engagement pour la, poli pour la politique de cohésion, Madame la Présidente de la Commission, nous le tenons pour dit. Nous ne l'oublierons pas. Cette promesse doit être respectée. Nous y veillerons. Merci beaucoup de votre attention. Thank you very much. Can I now please invite on stage Andreas Kondilis, who is with the Renew Europe group in the Committee of the Regions. Please, over to you. We are waiting to hear from you. Thank you very much. Dear President, dear Commissioner, dear colleagues, in recent years, cohesion funding has played a vital role in helping Athens and its surrounding areas to adapt to the challenges of climate change. One example is the redevelopment of the Eleonas district, transforming a former industrial area into green spaces that combat the urban heat island effect and enhance water management. Similarly, projects like the flood prevention measures along the Ilissos River are strengthening our resilience against increasingly intense rainfall and flash floods, while the restoration of the Kifisos River is helping to improve both flood management and biodiversity. However, despite those important steps, we face challenges. Bureaucratic delays have slowed processes and progress, and there's often a disconnect between climate adaptation and broader urban planning. Looking forward, the next cohesion framework must take a more integrated approach. We must simplify administrative processes to speed up project implementation and ensure that climate resilience is embedded in all levels of urban planning. We should also increase the use of nature-based uh, solutions by earmarking specific funds for green infrastructure and enhancing monitoring systems to measure the effectiveness of these projects. Finally, greater public engagement and stronger 
partnerships with the private sector will be crucial in ensuring long-term success. Together, these efforts can transform Athens and every city into a city that not only survives, but thrives in the face of climate change. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Could I now please invite on stage Marco Marsilio, who is president of the Abruzzo region and also president of the European Conservatives and Reformist Group in the Committee of the Regions. President, please, over to you. Caro Commissario, caro Presidente, cari colleghi, per rispondere efficacemente alle sfide che ha di fronte, è fondamentale che la politica di coesione sia in grado di supportare le regioni nelle sfide più importanti, che la sua attuazione sia semplificata e che i suoi obiettivi siano in linea con le priorità politiche regionali e nazionali. Sono convinto che il futuro Commissario Raffaele Fitto saprà sostenere una politica di coesione forte in linea con le priorità delle regioni europee. Come ben evidenziato nel report sulla competitività europea prodotto da Mario Draghi, è chiaro che la politica di coesione deve promuovere con maggior vigore la competitività dell'Unione, aiutando le nostre regioni a competere sul mercato globale e a saper non soltanto mantenere, ma anche creare posti di lavoro. Alla luce degli ambiziosi obiettivi di transizione verde e digitale imposti alle nostre regioni, diventa essenziale che la politica di coesione si ponga l'obiettivo concreto di favorire una transizione giusta per mitigare le conseguenze economiche negative delle rapide trasformazioni industriali in atto. Prendiamo ad esempio l'industria automobilistica, che impiega oltre 13 milioni di cittadini europei e rappresenta il 7% del prodotto interno lordo dell'Unione. Inutile dire che si tratta di un settore vitale per l'economia dell'Unione, come lo è anche per la mia stessa regione, l'Abruzzo. Ecco, le politiche di riduzione delle emissioni di CO2 stanno imponendo costi senza precedenti alle case automobilistiche, causando la chiusura di stabilimenti e la perdita di posti di lavoro lungo l'intera filiera. Per mantenere questo settore competitivo e soddisfare gli obiettivi climatici è indispensabile un supporto massiccio per agevolare la transizione dell'automotive e di altri settori che devono far fronte a oneri simili. Infine accolgo con favore l'enfasi che la nona relazione sulla coesione e la relazione annuale del CDR presentata oggi pongono sulla transizione demografica in Europa. Dobbiamo riconoscere che investire nella competitività delle nostre regioni è fondamentale anche per far fronte al declino demografico, permettendo ai cittadini di costruire una vita dignitosa ovunque scelgano di vivere. Grazie. Much. Thank you for that. Now, please welcome on stage Kieran McCarthy, who is a member of Cork City Council and also first vice president of the European Alliance Group in the Committee of the Regions. Uh, Mr. McCarthy, over to you. Uh, dear Mr. President, uh, dear Commissioner, uh, dear honoured guests, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, a session such as this uh, always presents uh, different messages. Um, in particular, uh, a celebration of our strongest allies uh, over the last five years, uh, a celebration of those who have advocated for a, a strong cohesion policy and for a stronger role of our region's, region's involvement, and a celebration of those who champion the empowerment of our local and regional authorities to achieve the plans for the people that they represent. And one just has to read the cohesion reports and the COR annual reports to see that cohesion has worked. It has contributed significantly to support and rebuild territories in a time of crises, and there have been many crises uh, in the past few short years. Indeed, because of the ambition of elements such as the green and the digital transition, never before um, has there been many long-term plans and visions of local and regional authorities, nearly all together on point in addressing common challenges. And never before um, have there been plans and visions of local and regional authorities so rich in detail uh, and so rich in ambition. And dear honoured guests, we the local and regional authorities have listened to the asks uh, of the European Union and have responded. And we respect the details of our partnership and have always asked for that respect within our partnership and the details to be reciprocated. But we remain concerned with the new emerging funding challenges. 
We've seen the creation of new instruments with new rules. We've seen more money being shifted away from cohesion. And as the discussions on the new MFF begin, we hear again arguments based on the logic of a fair return and that cohesion should be for just a few. Or we hear it's too complicated or it can't, it's inefficient, it can't be replicated. But let me say this clearly to the new ambition. Stop moving the goalposts. Stop the mixed messages and stop the rumours. Uh, local and regional authorities want to work with you. We want a strong, trust-filled partnership in multi-level governance. We share the importance of capacity building and performance and the importance of flexibility for regions and cities and the importance of reducing the red tape. But let us together shape a policy that can support our cities and regions as they need. Let us together critique the competing instruments overlapping with different rules. And in truth, if you empower the regions, if you empower the communities, then the EU will be a success. And to our two distinguished guests, Commissioner Ferreira and Mr Omerji, thanks for going on the journey with the CUR and thanks for trusting in us. And thanks for going, as a, a wise person once said on the stage here about half an hour ago, on the path uh, with us. Um, let us keep going on this journey uh, in cohesion uh, together. Thank you so much. And thanks to you. Uh, please welcome on stage Nina Ratilainen, who is a member of Turku City Council and also the co-president of the Greens in the Committee of the Regions. Over to you. Dear Commissioner, dear President and dear colleagues, please raise your hand if you have ever lived in a region that is not your current home region. Anyone? Please next raise your hand if you care about the well-being of other regions than just your own. Now look closely to your colleague there. Because today we don't discuss about how to ensure more cohesion funds to our own regions. We discuss of cohesion policy that leaves no one behind. That is also what I want to underline today on behalf of the Greens. We want policy and funds that puts focus on inclusive growth and addresses the unique needs of the regions. One that turns the gaze onto the citizens and especially those who face challenges and face disadvantages due to intersection of multiple vulnerabilities. While we prepare to face new crises in the regions and cities, the aftermath of previous ones still persists in people's lives. The COVID-19 pandemic worsened gender inequalities. The state of cities and regions report today tell us that 100 million people are at risk of poverty and social exclusion. The most vulnerable groups of the people are most often get left out in times of crisis and economic decline. They bear the brands. Now in cities and regions, we address the gaps of equity, but it is still work in progress. Sometimes people grow impatient, but how do we solve these challenges while the old ones still persist? With cohesion policy that is fit for the future, that is the answer that has been already tested and it has delivered. We have need for more sustainable, more inclusive developments. Larger proportion of the cohesion funds than so far should address the Green Deal. And besides strong focus on Green Deal and sustainable regions, we call the President of the European Commission keep pushing addressing on gender equality in European funding mechanisms. Let this be a success story, the future of cohesion policy that is fit for the future. A cohesion policy that does not leave anyone behind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to the leaders of, and representatives of all the political groups. And now I would like to call to this stage Mr. Yunus Omarjé, who is the Vice President of the European Parliament. Please join us on stage. We're very much looking forward to hearing from you. Monsieur le Président du Comité des Régions, Charles Vesco Cordero, Madame la Commissaire, à la cohésion, chère Elisa Ferreira, Mesdames et Messieurs les élus, mes chers amis, je ne reviendrai pas sur tout ce qui a été dit cet après-midi, mais je veux vous dire que je suis très heureux de me tenir devant vous en tant que vice-président du Parlement européen, 
en charge des relations avec les régions et les villes d'Europe et surtout en charge des relations avec le comité des régions. Et le président Vasco Cordero, comme vous-même, je crois, ne vont pas considérer que je sois immodeste en disant que je suis un ami du comité des régions. Je l'ai été pendant les cinq années où j'ai exercé la responsabilité du président de la commission du développement régional et l'une de mes priorités sera que les pratiques que nous avons mises en œuvre au sein de la commission du développement régional soient également mises en œuvre dans les autres commissions du Parlement européen. Car nous parlons cet après-midi de la cohésion, c'est important. Mais je sais aussi la plus-value du travail du comité des régions dans toutes les autres dimensions des politiques sectorielles de l'Union, qu'il s'agisse de la politique agricole commune, qu'il s'agisse de la politique énergétique, qu'il s'agisse de toutes les propositions qui sont les vôtres et qui doivent venir enrichir les travaux du Parlement européen. Cher président du comité des régions, j'y veillerai dans les nouvelles responsabilités qui sont les miennes. Je veux dire également à Elisa Ferreira le plaisir que j'ai eu pendant ces cinq ans à travailler avec elle. Et nous avons connu une législature, vous l'avez rappelé, Madame la Commissaire, tout à fait particulière qui a été marquée par des crises majeures, des crises profondes qui engageaient même l'avenir de l'Union européenne. Je pense évidemment à la pandémie du Covid-19 et puis, bien sûr, à la guerre en Ukraine. Et ensemble, nous avons su trouver les solutions. Mais plus encore, parce que, voyez-vous, je suis dans ce monde de la cohésion depuis un certain nombre d'années déjà, j'ai vu passer un certain nombre de commissaires et je peux vous dire qu'Elisa Ferreira a été et une très grande commissaire à la politique de cohésion et je veux cet après-midi devant le comité des régions rendre hommage au travail qui a été le vôtre. Et l'engagement, l'engagement personnel, c'est extrêmement important. Et nous devons tous, et nous sommes tous, nous devons tous être des militants pour les politiques européennes, des militants pour la politique de cohésion. Et vous toutes et tous, parce qu'on parle beaucoup évidemment de ce que doit faire le Parlement européen, de ce que doivent faire les commissaires européens, mais dans ce moment très particulier, vous avez toutes et tous une responsabilité éminente également en tant que président d'exécutifs régionaux, car vous devez, dans vos États membres respectifs, porter le flambeau de la politique de cohésion et convaincre les parlements nationaux, convaincre les États membres pour sauvegarder cette politique qui, nous le savons aujourd'hui, peut être menacée. Devant le Parlement européen, la présidente von der Leyen a pris un engagement clair, un engagement fort. Elle a pris en réalité un double engagement. D'abord, l'engagement d'une politique de cohésion renforcée, et c'est vrai que le nerf de la guerre, c'est le budget. Le deuxième engagement qu'elle a pris, c'est que la politique de cohésion se fera avec les régions. Et il ne peut pas y avoir de politique de cohésion sans les régions. Les régions sont le fondement, l'essence même de notre politique. On parle de politique de cohésion, mais on ne dit pas suffisamment que la politique de cohésion est une politique régionale. C'est comme ça qu'on a toujours appelé la politique de cohésion. C'est une politique régionale avec une direction régionale à la Commission européenne, avec une commissaire à la politique régionale et au Parlement européen, une commission du développement régional. Il ne peut pas y avoir de politique de cohésion sans les régions. Et 
la, le risque de recentralisation accompagne, je crois, un affaiblissement de la démocratie aujourd'hui en Europe. L'inquiétude, elle doit être là. La reconcentration n'est jamais une bonne indication. Et la renationalisation, ce risque de renationalisation, peut emporter l'ensemble des politiques européennes et l'ensemble des objectifs européens. Et c'est pourquoi la bataille que nous menons, ce n'est pas seulement une bataille de boutiquiers, de sauvegarde, de la cohésion, c'est une bataille pour tout le projet européen. Et c'est pourquoi cette bataille est importante. Je suis désolé, mais je vais continuer à adresser, à adresser, quelques, à adresser quelques messages. Vous, vous m'en excuserez. Nous, nous entrons également dans une législature qui sera marquée par des défis nouveaux, et en particulier celui de l'élargissement. La question de l'élargissement ne doit pas être une inquiétude, mais elle doit être préparée, elle doit être anticipée pour qu'elle soit gagnante pour tous. Et c'est le travail que doit faire aujourd'hui, je l'espère, le comité des régions, la Commission européenne, le Parlement européen pour atténuer au maximum les impacts négatifs des élargissements et assurer évidemment les impacts positifs. Pour conclure, dans ce temps de parole très, très limité, je veux dire, comme l'a fait la présidente Metzola, tout notre soutien, tout notre soutien aux régions et aux villes Ukraine, ukrainienne et tout notre soutien à l'Ukraine. Nous continuerons, comme nous l'avons fait, à soutenir l'Ukraine. On ne dit pas assez, on parle beaucoup des nombres de morts partout ailleurs dans le monde, mais le nombre de morts en Ukraine est un nombre qui dépasse l'entendement. Nous avons dépassé, je crois, les 500 000 morts. Cette guerre en Europe doit cesser, mais ce qui est certain, c'est que nous continuerons dans les responsabilités de notre à soutenir l'Ukraine. L'Ukraine vaincra. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention et je vous souhaite à toutes et à tous de très bons travaux. Thank you so much, Vice President. And uh, thank you, Vice President. And thank you also, Mayor Bock. I will invite you to take your seat. Commissioner, President, please stay on stage. Thank you so much. I realize we're only scratching the surface of so many of these really important topics today, but that is because we uh, want to hear from as many of you as possible. I invite you both to stay on stage for our last section now, which we are moving on to, which is all about regions and cities and an ambitious future for Europe. Vice President, you spoke very eloquently there about Ukraine and European support from Ukraine, so I would like to go there first. Let's kick off this last section with a video message from Vitaly Klitschko, who is Mayor of Kiev and also the Chair of the Association of Ukrainian Cities. Шановний Ваксо Алвес Кордеро, шановна Еліза Феррера, шановні учасники Європейського тижня міста регіонів, вітаю вас від більше ніж тисячі громад, членів Асоціації міст України. Дякуємо вам, дякуємо за допомогу та підтримку, яку Європейський Союз надає Україні під час війни та готовність підтримувати українські громади в процесах відновлення та відбудови. Асоціація міст України системно формує спільну позицію місцевого середування щодо захисту інтересів мешканців, сіл, селищ та міст. Всіх регіонів України щодо різних сфер діяльності місцевого середування, тимчасово окупованих, деокупованих громад, між муніципальної співпраці, ми надаємо свої пропозиції парламенту, уряду та президенту. Надавали пропозиції щодо регламенту Ukraine Facility. І дякуємо за включення в механізм муніципальної складової. Маємо вже сьогодні успішні проекти відновлення після декупації громад Київщини, Харківщини, Херсонщини, Чернігівщини. 
і навіть стратегії відновлення деяких тимчасово окупованих громад, наприклад, Маріуполю. Важливо, щоб місцеве самоврядування було збережене сьогодні і відновлено скрізь після нашої перемоги. Тому ми в Асоціації міст України спільно з нашими міжнародними партнерами підготували концепцію відновлення місцевого самоврядування України. Хочу подякувати професору Георгу Мільбранту, спецпредставнику уряду Німеччини з децентралізації, групі послів J7, Конгресу місцевих та регіональних влад Ради Європи, Ради європейських муніципалітетів і регіонів, Європейському альянсу міст і регіонів для відбудови України, Європейського комітету регіонів. Ми знаємо. Знаємо, що робити і робимо все, що можемо в цей драматичний час. Найважливіше – допомога військовим і перемога демократичному світу відновлення миру. І вже сьогодні ми готові до майбутнього відновлення та оновлення нашої держави спільними зусиллями і за підтримки наших партнерів і друзів. Щиро вам дякую. Вітання з міста Києва. And we are going to stay in Kyiv now because, dear guests, we have something very special for you. We have now a live link to Kyiv where a meeting of the board of the Association of Ukrainian Cities has been taking place. That's a gathering of mayors of Ukrainian municipalities. So do we have the live link established? They have been waiting for us very patiently. Okay, there they are. Give them a round of applause, everyone. And this just shows you this European Week of Regions and Cities is not, is not at all something confined to this bubble here in Brussels. It's right across this continent. I would like to hand over now, live, direct from Kyiv, to uh, Olena Sidorenko, who is the mayor of Orzhitsa in the Poltava region. Please, mayor, you have four minutes. Thank you very much. We are listening. Can you hear us? Okay, I think we're having some technical problems here. Can you hear us, Mayor Sidorenko? Okay, right. I think we have a, a, a technical issue here, which is um, very unfortunate, but let's see if we can try and fix that. And in the meantime, I'm going to bring on stage a representative from another candidate country, because of course Ukraine is not the only per, uh, country on that list. So please could I invite on stage Yonida Halili, who is Deputy Mayor of Tirana. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Please join us on stage. And in the meantime, our colleagues will try and re-establish that connection. Deputy Mayor, please take a seat. So do you want to give us uh, some of your insights on what we've heard so far? I mean, until now, we have really been focusing almost exclusively on the European Union itself. But give us the view from Tirana. Take us there. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Dear uh, President, dear Madam Commissioner, dear participant in this uh, big event of the Regional Committee, I am very happy. I'm a great uh, pleasure for me to represent Tirana today and to address uh, this session about the specific needs of the uh, local governments uh, towards the, uh, the, the European integration. Uh, we take uh, much proud of Tirana being a very vital, a very vibrant and very fast developing city and we represent the aspiration of the Albanians uh, towards the European uh, integration. And uh, we are very glad now to share these values with one million uh, tourists on a monthly basis and uh, uh, to share our values uh, with them. Uh, you will. Uh, I can continue with. Please uh, go ahead. With, uh, yeah. the, with my summary, or absolutely. Okay, great. So, uh, what I wanted to uh, to mention in this uh, very short uh, addressing that I'm going to do today is that uh, usually and uh, especially in candidate countries, we uh, see we have seen the European integration as a 
as a matter of big politics, where the main role is of the central government, which is certainly true, but we are uh, now finding out that cities and regions have an increasingly and very important role to play in this process. And as Albania is getting ready to open negotiation for EU uh, integration, we have learned that almost 70% of the aki, which uh, are the country uh, that our country must transpose into legislations, uh, affect local uh, governance uh, administration. So, but while this decision making uh, is uh, very central. Uh, Local government has little access in uh, uh, in uh, European pol policy making, in EU policy making. So one of the question that arises here is that uh, how can city and region make their voices heard in the EU, EU level? And certainly the first step may be uh, the official one, and that's why we are uh, gathered here today to discuss uh, everything uh, related, and that regions and cities can amplify their voices by engaging actively, actively in platforms like uh, uh, European Committee of Regions that we are uh, uh, is hosting us today, uh, but it's important that uh, local uh, uh, and uh, local uh, administrative uh, 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 cities and regions, let's say. Uh, have more information because more information flow will help us to improve our readiness for the uh, enlargement process. And another step may be leveraging regional association, other associations such as Eurocities or Council of European Municipalities and Regions, where cities, these are platforms that uh, or forums that uh, uh, where cities can uh, collectively advocate for uh, uh, for the uh, common interests uh, during the policy reviews, ensuring that local, local concerns are part of a broader uh, EU discussions. And twinning and partnerships may be also another, uh, may, may play also an, uh, another important role and can uh, create a unified voice uh, for advocating lo local priorities. Uh, collaborating on EU fund projects is a very important issue that uh, we have to bring on this uh, discussion because uh, uh, cities and uh, regions have to make their voices heard, demonstrating readiness for the integration. And uh, I would also want to mention that uh, the empowerment of cities and regions goes hand in hand with decentralization process and an increased financial autonomy. Strengthening autonomy uh, of local and uh, regional administ administrations uh, through decentralization of powers can be achieved by uh, providing greater uh, control over their budgets and decision-making processes and ensuring that they effectively address uh, specific community needs. Uh, so, Thank you very much. I'm going to just uh, interrupt okay. you here. Thank you so much for, for uh, joining us on stage. Please give her a round of applause. Deputy Mayor of Tirana, Yorida Halili, thank you very much for your time. Just, we now, I think, do have uh, Kiev on the line, ready to, to try and re-establish connection to them. Can we try and get that live link back up? Yes, okay, there they are. This is um, my Eurovision Song Contest moment. So this is Brussels calling. Can you hear us? Mayor Sidorenko, can you hear us? Okay, uh, I'm going to try one more time to hand over to you. Mayor Sidorenko, please, can you hear us? And if so, with the floor is yours. Okay, I think we have a connection issue there. Mayor Sidorenko, I believe you don't hear us. Can you see, see us and hear us in Brussels? Okay, I think the technology is really against us here. Oh, yeah, okay. Floor is yours. Let's see if I can do some uh, improvised sign language. 
Сьогодні ми, Асоціації міст України, приєдналися до відкриття Європейського тижня регіонів та міст, що є підтвердженням наближення нашої країни до Європейського Союзу. Ми високо цінуємо, що для європейської спільноти важливо почути голос наших громад. Тому зараз тут присутні мери з усіх куточків України, з півдня і з півночі, з ходу і заходу, з центральної України. Ми представляємо як великі міські громади, так і невеликі селища та сільські територіальні громади. Це громади стилових територій, то громади, які вже деокуповані, а також громади із зони активних бойових дій і тимчасово окупованих. Вже третій рік наші громади, вся Україна, перебувають в умовах широкомасштабної війни, що значно змінило всі наші пріоритети. Війна Росії проти України спричинила великі втрати, руйнування, пошкодження майна, втрата людського ресурсу. Українські муніципалітети змушені адаптувати свої громади до умов воєнних дій. Ми всі максимально допомагаємо нашим Збройним силам України для нашої спільної перемоги. Всі муніципалітети створюють умови для мешканців своїх громад, але вже звичайно по-різному, в залежності від того, яким чином війна дотикнулась до тої чи іншої території. Тилові та деокуповані громади організовують надання послуг мешканцям, забезпечують життя внутрішнім переміщеним особам, будують укриття для освітніх та медичних закладів, відбудовують зруйновані об'єкти та інфраструктуру. У зоні бойових дій на межі кордону чи фронту з Російської Федерації муніципалітети організовують евакуацію мешканців, забезпечення тих, хто залишається, у рідних домівках першою необхідними допомогами. Тимчасово окуповані громади об'єднані в секцію Асоціації міст України, де обмінюються досвідом з деокупованими та роблять все, щоб зберегти наших громадян, щоб спільно з людьми сформувати спільне бачення нашого майбутнього і готуватися до відновлення після нашої перемоги. І це відновлення має бути за принципом краще, ніж було, з дотриманням нових технологій, можливостей зеленої енергетики. Для всіх муніципалітетів черговим додатковим випробуванням стане зима в умовах війни, коли заздалегідь необхідно передбачити усі ризики в умовах постійних обстрілів. Маємо подбати про забезпечення базових потреб – вода, тепло, укриття, харчування, медична допомога, освітні послуги у разі відсутності централізованого енергопостачання. Дуже складно, повірте. А ще складніше, коли не знаєш, що таке вибуху. В Україні немає безпечних місць. І це не просто слова. Так, навантаження ризиків скрізь різне. Та все ж кожен мер боїться виїхати з свого муніципалітету, оскільки щохвилини – Може бути приліт, і треба організувати допомогу своєму населенню. Але навіть за таких умов для нас важливим є наближення Європейського Союзу, продовження реформи із децентралізації. Бо ми воюємо за спільні демократичні європейські цінності. Ми маємо імплементувати їх у життя. Від Асоціації міст України ми запропонували на державному рівні схвалити концепцію відновлення місцевого самоврядування. Це стратегічний документ, який на десятиріччя визначає децентралізаційний курс України. Він буде спрямовувати демократичний напрямок усіх наступних законодавчих змін. Дякуємо всім нашим європейським та міжнародним партнерам за участь у підготовці цієї концепції, яка передбачає впровадження нової якості публічного управління при відновленні, а не тільки відбудову об'єктів. Ефективним публічне управління держави буде тільки при чіткому 
та зрозумілому розподілі повноважень між органами державної влади та органами місцевого самоврядування. При чіткому розмежуванні з фінансовим забезпеченням і обов'язковим принципом дотримання Європейської хартії місцевого самоврядування. Про це також йдеться в концепції відновлення місцевого самоврядування в Україні. Користуючись нагодою, дякую кожному з вас, нашим європейським партнерам, за формалізацію партнерств між нашими громадами. Це складний шлях який багато років з українського боку допомагає Асоціація міст України. Але цей шлях демонструє практичне підтвердження нашої співпраці. Повірте, угоди про співробітництво з європейськими муніципалітетами дають кожній українській громаді впевненість і відчуття спільності з Європою про те, що ми не одні, у цьому важкому світі. Ми вдячні всім вам, вдячні європейським муніципалітетам і країнам за допомогу у розвитку місцевого самоврядування України та за допомогу у захисті незалежності нашої держави. Ми віримо в нашу перемогу, але без вас здобути її буде значно складніше і значно довше. Дякуємо за підтримку, віримо в у європейське спрямування України. Віримо в наші Збройні Сили України. Слава Україні! so much and uh, please while you are uh, applauding I'd like to welcome to the stage some of our young elected politicians they're going to speak uh, briefly because unfortunately the timer is really against us here we want this to be an inclusive event but we only have limited time with our very hard-working interpreters so please could I first call to the stage Theresa Neumann who is the mayor of Groß Kotzenberg uh, she will be addressing us. Uh, Theresa Neumann, uh, could I please ask you to be brief in your intervention? As I said, the timer is against us here. Thank you very much. Over to you. Dear President, dear Commissioner, dear members of the COR, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and truly an honor to be here today and to have the possibility to address words to you. I would like to talk about two aspects concerning the topic regions and cities ambitious for the future of Europe. The first one, regions and cities are an elementary component for the further development and thus for the future of the EU. A close cooperation between EU institutions and the local level is therefore necessary. Many concrete projects for political challenges, for instance relating to the digital and green transition, are being developed locally in the regions and cities. These projects are mostly implemented on the local level. I am the mayor of a small municipality near Frankfurt Main in Germany. As a power plant location, we deal, for example, with the decarbonization of district heating and the energy transition. Locally, you can arouse interest in current political issues such as the climate crisis and the energy transition. At the same time, you can create enthusiasm for Europe. Regions and cities are thus an opportunity to shape the future of the EU. A close cooperation between the EU institutions and the regions and cities is therefore very important. The second aspect. Young, per young people's perspectives on political issues must be included in shaping the future of the EU. The youth should be strongly involved in political decision-making processes in the regions and cities as well as in the EU institutions. We also need to bring European political issues closer to young people to make Europe and the advantages of the EU more visible. This can be achieved, for example, by strengthening school exchanges and town twinning programs. In my opinion, the perspective of young people with regard to European policy issues can be more integrated through a youth advisory council for the European Committee of the Regions, 
Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That was Mayor Theresa Neumann. Now let's hear from Joshua Klisovic, who is president of the Assembly of Zagreb. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you. Dear colleagues, the least the Europeans can expect from Europe to be whole, free, at peace, as the former US president put it in 1989. But that goal has not been attained. And the situation on our eastern borders clearly testifies to that. Europe will attain that goal when all European nations will be under the same roof, under one roof called European Union. And the enlargement policy is that vehicle which is going to bring us under the same roof. The enlargement policy is one of the most successful and most beneficial policies for the EU member states and the candidate states alike. EU member states can really seize the moment, the opportunity, and speed up the reforms we need, including to achieve effective decision-making process. We can achieve as well revision of rules, budget, and structure in order to welcome newcomers. We will extend the area of prosperity and security beyond our current borders. And make no mistake, no walls, no barbed wires, no army can protect you better than friendship, honest cooperation, and rules and values we all share within the same political structure we call European Union. EU will extend its common market and create new business opportunity, increase its international and global role. And candidate countries will definitely have a guidance how to reform during the accession process. Very beneficial to uh, really achieve desired reform. And what we, as the local authorities, can do, we can share our knowledge how to run the cities and regions. We can inform the public in candidate countries what is the membership and accession. We can create a new, better atmosphere and support for the EU. We can execute jointly projects financed by the EU which make the lives of citizens in candidate countries better. This is important and help them establish and maintain local uh, political institutional infrastructure. So Ukraine, Western Balkans, Georgia, Moldova and others, let's do it together. Thank you very much. Let's hear now from Nicola Emily Larson, who is a municipal board member in Rudisdale. Please, over to you. Thank you so much for keeping your intervention brief. Thank you. When talking about the future of Europe, it's impossible not to mention the youth. As a young elected politician, I'm proud to represent the future because that's what the youth is. But the truth is the future of Europe depends on the but the truth is the future of the Europe depends on the youth, not just because we are the next generation, but because we are already shaping the present. In Denmark, more and more young people are being elected to municipalities and regional governments. I was the youngest ever elected in my municipality at 19 years old. But this momentum must reach European institutions and across countries as well. Right now, the average age of MEPs is 50 years old, which is a clear indication for me that there is still work to be done in ensuring that youth have a real voice at the highest levels of decision making. Ensuring a strong future for Europe is about more than empowering its youth. It's about making the EU relevant for all its citizens. The future of Europe isn't distant or abstract. It's built in the towns and communities where people live and work. Whether it's improving infrastructure or tackling climate challenges, it's at the local level where EU policies come to life. We must ensure that the EU is not seen as a remote institution, but as an active partner in addressing the everyday challenges people face. Although the 2024 election saw the highest voter turnout in 30 years, with 50.74% participating, it's still not enough. We need to be ambitious in building a sustainable Europe where participation is not just encouraged, but it's a natural part of every citizen's life. 
Lastly, the future of Europe must always uphold and fight for our core values, freedom, equality, and democracy, both within our borders and beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much. And last but not least, in this section, let's welcome on Julia Darnitska from Chernihiv City Council. Please, over to you. Dear colleagues, for me, as a young politician and representative of Ukraine youth, joining the European Union is not just a political decision. It's a personal dream of my generation. We grew up withering um, the revolution of dignity and the devastating consequences Russia brought to our land. We have endured the fight for freedom, democracy, and justice. The European Union embodies these values to us, and every day we work to bring them to life in Ukraine. I see that our generation want to live in a world of opportunities, work, travel, study, build businesses, and uh, freely pursue our ambitions. My city, Chernihiv, is located in 80 kilometers from the border with Russia, and we are one among the first who met the enemy in 2022. But we stood strong, defended our city, and now we are in the process of recovering. Uh, this resilience reflects, reflects our strength and unwavering commitment to a better future. Ukraine is currently undergoing incredible difficult trials. We are determined to break free from the oppression that has stifled our identity, culture, and potential for the centuries. Together, we will contribute to Europe's rich culture tapestry and work towards to a shared future where we can grow and collaborate. Through, uh, so we are going, we are young democracy and uh, we are resolute in our pursuit of development in this direction. I'm confident that Ukraine will be a strong and stable partner. Together we will win. Glory to Ukraine and glory to all our partners. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, a very brief uh, word from the audience now. I'd like to hear from Barbara Hegedush, who I believe is in place 350. Just, uh, we're going to give you 30 seconds or so. Give us some, uh, sometimes we call it closing word. Give us a couple of closing sentences to uh, take us toward the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our enlargement is far more than an administrative challenge. It is a geopolitical imperative that threatens both the EU and the countries that are given the opportunity to join. Over the past years, we have witnessed a lot of sacrifice and commitment showing candidate countries' dedication uh, to our shared values. Now it is up to us to honor these commitments by advancing their accession process with renewed vigor. Enlargement is also about fostering regional cooperation and investing in shared prosperity. A key aspect of this process is preparing regions and cities in both current and future member states to manage these changes effectively. Yet their active involvement is crucial. We are on the front lines of implementing EU policies and our engagement will ensure that the benefits of enlargement can be enjoyed by all. Let us seize this moment to accelerate the integration process, ensuring that the vision of a united and strong Europe becomes a reality. Thank you. Thank you so much. And let's now hear from Maxim Kozitsky. I believe you're in place 115. Do we have you here? Yes, please, over to you. And as I said, as brief as you can, because we are just finishing up now. Dear Mr. President, Madam Commissioner, Honorable Members, Distinguished Guests, it's a great honor for me to address you today on behalf of our Lviv region of Ukraine and the Chamber of Regions of the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities under the President of Ukraine. I would like to thank the Committee for its support for Ukraine, in particular with the appreciate of Committee's and point plan for supporting Ukraine. Additionally, I would like to remind the regional development in our country face, faces challenges. 
that are not conventional for the European context. As well, as we are still facing the aggression of Russian Federation, the war, which is an open violation of UN Charter. It is important, important to understand that this war affects not only the frontline regions, but the whole country and EU too. About a month ago, on the night of September 4th, the enemy attacked the Lviv region with missiles and drones. Despite the efforts of our defenders, the missiles killed eight people, including one child, and injured 64 others. One family was killed in one day, a mother and three daughters. Dozen of residential houses were damaged, as well as several educational and medical institutions. I would like to stress that this occurred, occurred 60 kilometers from the border of the European Union in a member of the EU Eastern Partnership and the EU candidate country. Currently, we are preparing for the coming winter, which we expect to be extremely difficult. Russia is trying to instill fear in us by destroying our energy infrastructure. Strong, strongly believe that such barbaric methods will not crush our people. We will, stand, we will stand. So I appeal to you to be ready to stand by our side and support us. I would like to affirm that Ukrainian regions seek to be not merely beneficiaries of European assistance, but also active partners who are ready to share their experience and together to formulate the response to our common challenges. I believe that all Ukrainian Association will work together to regional development and decentralization. And our regional and district council, cities and villages are open to establish a new partnership. And on that thought of new partnerships, a, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much. Let us work together for a secure and prosperous future. We are strong together. Let's Slava work Ukraine. together. That was the last message. Thank you so much for that. I'm sorry to cut you off, sir, but we are really just at the very end of our maximum time here. So uh, I would like to ask you to give a round of applause to all of our speakers today and, of course, also to uh, Deputy Mayor Halili. I know I interrupted you earlier. Do you want to give us a final sentence before you go? Thank you very much. Then I'll ask you to leave the stage. Um, I would hand over to Commissioner Ferrero just for uh, a last closing thought here, if you would. Do you have uh, something you'd like to share for us just for the, the very end? of this. What Thank you very a... much. I, I think it's impossible to, to sum up yeah. all the, the rich information, experiences and uh, that we have shared today. So thank you very much to all of you. Keep your, the momentum, keep your energy, keep your conviction, your trust, because Europe is a political project. Usually uh, Europe is based on mutual trust and with trust and with conviction I think we are going to have another five years and much more than five years of